It's the world this week, seven days for Paris Space Correspondence, one hour. The world this week in partnership with the Daily Beast, Christopher Dickey, foreign editor, is with us. How are you, sir? Happy to be here, as always. Happy to happy to welcome you. Happy to welcome as well uh, Mark Bassett, Paris Bureau Chief of Spanish daily newspaper El País. Thank you. Busy week? Yeah, quite busy. Quite busy. Okay. Was it quite busy for Christina Okello? It was very busy. Sister station Our, Radio France yes. International. Our right. Fanger Service also launched its new reform this week, so we've had a lot of uh, a lot of stuff to learn, a lot of video reporting to do. So, uh, as well as covering the news, we've also been learning new new skills and techniques. So, all right, that's, all about, all about that's that over that later. the English service yes. of Radio France International, and uh, we welcome back, as always, Gregory Viscusi of Bloomberg News. You're saying it's been all about. It's been very busy. Carlos been, Ghosn. Carlos, Carlos Ghosn, Ghosn is a big we'll story. Yeah. Big, Ghosn. big story. We'll keep you busy later. The World This Week on Facebook and Twitter. Hashtag World This Week. We forgot about Gibraltar, Spain's <laughs> prime minister, who's on a visit to Cuba ahead of this coming Sunday's uh, summit in Brussels to ratify that draft divorce deal with Britain, insists he won't sign if the status of the disputed territory isn't treated separately from the rest. Gibraltar, which we must admit had failed to rate the astounding soap opera that is Brexit, had failed to rate up until now. Last night I spoke to the Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez, and I'm confident that on Sunday we'll be able to agree a deal that delivers for the whole UK family, including Gibraltar. Now, since that Thursday statement outside Downing Street, Pedro Sanchez has weighed in over Twitter. And, uh, well, he's saying he's not ready yet to sign on the dotted line. If there are no changes, we will veto Brexit. Of course, Mark Bassett, it's not quite a veto because uh, you don't need unanimity on Sunday, but they would like everyone to be able to sign. Exactly. The, technically, I think uh, you don't need a veto, but, uh, you know, what, what, what impression would you give uh, to well, have a divided... Are you surprised team? that Gibraltar suddenly comes up now? I'm surprised and I'm not surprised. I'm, not, I'm surprised because it didn't come up uh, until now, since the negotiations started. But you have to take into account that Gibraltar, uh, even if it's a tiny piece of land in southern, the southern Iberian Peninsula. Uh, <laughs> you were going to say southern Spain. I know <laughs> you, that's what you were yes, going to say. Yes, yes. Yeah. So uh, it's a vital interest for Spain. It's a question of sovereignty. Spain has reclaimed sovereignty for a long time. With Gibraltar. And Gibraltar, always when there is a, something between the UK and Spain, the UK and Europe, at the end, it, it always uh, com comes up, you know? Yeah, let, let's hear how, how they're talking about it. Who can forget, after all, the Treaty of Utrecht? The Spanish, it dates back to 1713. We do not recognize Gibraltar as part of the United Kingdom. We assume it is the UK who should represent Gibraltar, but it is not part of the United Kingdom. This is a colonial situation that Spain will not permit. We are not going to accept the European Commission imposing a relationship between us and this colony. And this colony, Christopher Dickey. Well, look, uh, you know, all over the world there are what used to be called imperial confetti of these great uh, colonial powers like France and, and uh, Great Britain. You know, why are the Malvinas or the Falklands, why are they part of Great Britain? Why is Gibraltar part of Great Britain? It does go back to treaties in the 18th century, in the 17th century. And, uh, and I think, you know, there's been a lot of desire to rethink those by lots of different countries in different times. With Europe, when there was a united Europe, before people were trying to tear apart the European Union, all of that could be covered up. I mean, we're all part of Europe, so it doesn't matter quite as much the status of Gibraltar. But once Britain wants to pull out of Europe, then Gibraltar becomes a real issue. Who's, who, where does it belong? Where, who, what is it part of? In fact, physically, clearly, it's part of the Iberian Peninsula. Yeah, but on the other hand, the, the, the inhabitants there want to be British. I mean, that's been clear in, in sort of vote after vote. Same, same in the Malvinas. So. And you they voted, for, they you mean voted the Falcons. overwhelmingly to remain. They voted to remain in the EU, yeah, yeah. but not to become part of Spain. 96% voted to remain in the EU. Yeah. But, but that's true, of, well, it was not 96% in Scotland, but that doesn't mean that Scotland wants to be, but it was pretty high, big in Scotland too. It doesn't mean Scotland wants to be... In fact, Scotland may be more inclined country. to break away from Britain than, than <laughs> Gibraltar now. is. I mean, I, I, I'm British. I, I'd be really upset that Gibraltar, that I wouldn't be able to travel to Gibraltar as easy as before. I mean, I think... Personally, Brexit is a, is a big mistake, but that's not the issue here. 
Uh, Gibraltar is a beautiful place. It's got great uh, botanic um, uh, animal life. I, I went there, I think, five years ago. Got the great um, reception from from the the, the uh, tourist from not the tourists but locals and even the monkeys. It's there's monkeys everywhere when you climb up the top top of the mountains. They they baboons, they're, they're right? there. They the say apes, yeah, the baboons. Yeah. So it's I mean I think the whole issue the rift it's it's you know uh, Europe is um is, is falling apart. I, I don't want to be uh, a little bit um, how should we say cynical, but we mm. do have to talk about the timing of all of this mm. uh, because apparently in nearby Andalusia there are regional elections coming up. Is this about that? Okay, it might have some some impact because Gibraltar. Okay, it's in the southern part of the Iberian Peninsula of Spain <laughs> yes. and of Andalusia. So right. if it belonged to Spain, uh, if it ever belonged to Spain, it would be part of uh, Andalusia. So this is grandstanding? It may, it may have an impact. Also, it may have an impact that uh, Pedro Sánchez, the, the, pre the current prime minister, is uh, center-left and he's under a lot of pressure of the uh, Spanish right, which is likes to do a big uh, fuss about nationalistic uh, uh, issues, but I think that there is also a technical issue. The Spanish uh, government says it thought that it was solved in the agreement that was being negotiated by the European Commission with the UK, and uh, when the agreement was presented to Theresa May, the Prime, British Prime Minister, it discovered the wording was not as the Spanish thought uh, it would be, you know. So this is why they reopened this case. It's not a question of now, today, of sovereignty. Spain, Spain, Spain is not claiming to uh, have the sovereignty over over Gibraltar, but of having the final say in any negotiation or dealing in the future with uh, with Gibraltar. And there's always last minute jockeying whenever the EU signs anything important. Fishing, the fishing, French yeah, and the I was Dutch. Gonna say, are... say fishing is the other one that could hold up an agreement Saturday. I mean, there's a there's a, there's a there's a summit. Sorry, Sunday. There's a summit Sunday in Brussels, as you know, to it's supposed to just be to sign this accord. Um, the schedule calls for the five for the meeting to end at noon. So I mean, the general thinking is that either. Either they're all in agreement and it's over by noon, in fact, or else they're going to haggle over Gibraltar and fishing and we're going to be there till midnight. So, yeah, and one or the other. After Sunday, the attention will turn squarely back to Britain and Theresa May's, shall we say, long shot bid to win a majority in Parliament for the deal. Uh, Matt in the Daily Telegraph playing on Theresa May's uh, long used and now discarded mantra that uh, no deal is better than a bad deal. Here, it's a, a bad deal is better than no deal. It's been uh, turned turned around. Now, uh, that uh, divorce deal, because there, there's two parts to this. It's important to point it out. The divorce deal looks final. It's the political statement that comes with it. It was originally seven pages long. It's been fleshed out to give UK lawmakers a sense of what they negotiate when we graduate to phase two, the post-Brexit relationship with the continent. The floor goes to the right honorable gentleman from Islington North. 19 extra pages, but nothing has changed. The only certainty contained within these pages is that the transition period will have to be extended or we will end up with a backstop and no exit. Christopher Dickey. Well, it's a process that looks like it's just going to go on and on and on. And you know how much I love this process. <laughs> <laughs> we all do. But I think I'm surprised that Theresa May has even lasted this long. I mean, I yeah. think, you know, as a woman, she's a real inspiration. I mean, you, you, you either love, you, you can love her, you can hate her, but, you know, you have to give her credit for, for being able to, to stick she's at it. You know, she, she has really proven you know, what, her metal and what she's, uh, what she's worth. And... And yeah, what, BBC reporter not Brexit, earlier telling her is some people want to hug you and others want to shake you. Yeah, <laughs> but you know she she does it with finesse and, and style. I mean, if you've seen her shoes, every time she she gets up and in, in front of uh, Downing Street, you know she's always she's you know she's well dressed and she and she gives it. She gives she sells her her pitch well. I mean, we, we still don't know whether or not Brexit. Will so she could still place. get the, it could still pass mustard at Westminster. Uh, I, I, I think so. I mean, I, I I wouldn't rule her out. I mean, she, her opponents like like Boris Johnson have tried to. You know, desperately uh, oust her, and she's still standing. So it's. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if she looks solid, but she looks. <laughs> the, the, actually, in that BBC interview you mentioned, I mean, the video of it is phenomenal. She looks like she's going to a party. Mm -hmm. She looks ecstatic. Yeah. Uh, so I guess she thinks that she's going to survive at the very least. Yeah. Mark Bassett, what does your crystal ball tell you? Uh, we should look at uh, her rivals, you know, and perhaps that's why she looks so good. <laughs> <laughs> in this situation. It may look so bad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
I mean, she seems to have survived the challenge from within her party. They had to mm. get 48 votes yeah. within her party to overthrow. They didn't get that. So she survived. through in the towel. Yeah, so mm-hmm. she's, she, she survived that step. Yeah. The numbers just aren't there. The problem is it's a minority government. The Northern Irish people are not going to, the Northern Ireland's small group that she relies on for support are probably not going to vote for her because they don't like the way Northern Ireland's treated in this thing. There's a, probably enough Europhile Tories, there are a few Europhile Tories who will vote against it, and then it depends what Labour does. And that's, and that's going to that's gonna have to do with sort of political jockeying. It's not going to have to do with what their views of Brexit mm-hmm. are. It's going to have to do with what sort of political calculations they although can make. Corbyn, although Corbyn is not, uh, is in favour of Brexit, basically. Officially he's not, in fact. Yeah, yeah, officially, officially he's not, but in fact he all, For all intents and purposes, he is. For all intents and purposes, he is, but... Uh, his party is not, no. His yeah. party is yeah. not, and there seems to be this coalescing movement that goes from the Labour Party to the Conservative Party that is pushing more and more for that second referendum that seems like a long shot, and now you have to wonder about that. Well, I think procedurally it's still very hard to do. I mean, But, but why? The first one wasn't binding. I've never understood mm-hmm. what the hang-up is about a second referendum. Like... Because I when think we elect people, you have a right to vote them out, you know, it's, it's like you can change. What was it, 58%, 42%? Uh, 52, 40. 52, 50, 40. So yeah. 52% of British voters voted uh, against, uh, voted yes to Brexit. So it's it's a binding... It wasn't binding, but it wasn't. It was officially, was not. it was a consultation. It was not binding. But, but okay. I think it was, a, we see now that it was a, a clear case of a referendum where one of the options could not be applied, really. Because how do you apply Brexit? I think all the yeah. mess that we are yeah. in... Is a demonstration. Because no that one thought they would, they would actually go through. Everyone but, was surprised. Well, but, this, after, but, but why? Why Cameron, the prime minister at the time, was such an idiot that he wanted to do this in the first place is yeah. a huge question. Because referendums are never really about the thing the no. referendum is no. about. No. Referendums no. are always basically a popularity yeah. contest and for the ruling party. He but wanted he, to show up his popularity. But he got his yeah. way with the Scottish referendum. Well, yes, lucky for him, I guess. <laughs> But that was a different. That was a different, different situation because, because that, that that was contained to one area. It wasn't. Mm-hmm. It couldn't be turned into a yes or no vote on the national government because it was only in one region. Uh, oh, uh, well, one final. Also, point. let's not forget all the lying that went on by the by the Brexiteers. Yeah, and some exaggerating by the Remain people too. They, oh well, there, I don't there, know. There was, about, I don't know about ma- that. Great. There was some massive exaggerations on both sides. What, one final point on this. You mentioned it, which is the DUP. Uh, the Northern Irish Unionist Party that props up Theresa May's government, it's got 10 seats at Westminster. And this week it started abstaining on uh, votes. It's holding its party conference uh, this weekend. And uh, we're going to see both parts of the uh, Conservative Party represented because there's going to be Philip Hammond there, who's got Theresa May's ointment. And we're going to see Boris Johnson, who's her, who's her rival, showing up at that DUP conference. Mark Bassett, Spain's foreign minister, uh, putting a bit of fuel on the fire this week when he said uh, he thought there was a, a, a better chance of having uh, an independent uh, Scotland before uh, a break, a breakup, excuse me, of the UK before a breakup of Spain and sort of giving a tacit endorsement for Scotland to join the EU afterwards. Well, that's interesting because first the, 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 the Spanish government was never very enthusiastic about uh, the Scottish independence because it could be an example uh, for Catalonia and other uh, regions of Spain. But second, I think he's right. I mean, uh, uh, there's, there are more probabilities that Scotland becomes independent than Catalonia in the first place because uh, uh, the UK allows uh, a referendum on, on independence and it, there could be another referendum, whereas Spanish legislation, as we have seen in the constitutional uh, structure of Spain, doesn't allow for a secession or independent referendum. What, the, what, what's, what was behind those, those remarks by Josep Morel? Well, uh, I, th- I, I think it was a, a realistic uh, assessment of what, uh, what is going on uh, in, in, in the UK, really, uh, and in, the, in these ne- negotiations about, uh, about Brexit. I don't know if there is an intention uh, about Spanish in, in internal politics uh, in these declarations. Don't look at me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, quick, we're going to uh, move on and just take a look at uh, what you have to consider to be a crash landing. The boss of the world's top-selling automaking alliance, plucked by police from his private jet at Tokyo Airport at the start of the week. Now Carlos Ghosn is out of a job at Nissan and Mitsubishi on his way out at Renault, getting three bowls of rice a day inside a Tokyo prison. 
the highest paid CEO in France, was also the highest paid CEO in Japan, and uh, allegedly held, hid a big portion of his pay from the tax man. Way beyond feeling sorry, I feel great anger and disappointment. I'm forced to say that we are talking about the dark side of the Gone era, which lasted for many years. Many fascinating facets to this story, starting with that press conference where uh, Hiroto Saikawa, our, our own Yuka Hoye, uh, who, who, who was monitoring it, pointed out he never did the thing that you see in Japan where when there's an apology, you bow in contrition. There was little contrition. There was no contrition from his part and more sort of more alarmingly, I don't know how, what, the, what the exact word to use is, he was also announcing decisions that would be taken by his board that hadn't met yet. You know, the board was the, the Nissan board, which fired Go and met hours after that press conference. Yet he was announcing it all basically as if they didn't even need to have the board meeting, um, which, as you've probably seen in France, there's been lots of talk that this was a coup, you know, that this was all sort of set up by Nissan. Interestingly, the French government's not taking that view. I mean, I've spoken to advisors at the French government and they they actually are taking the accusations against Ghosn fairly seriously and are not accusing the Japanese. Because there's two theories, right? There's the theory that it was uh, this whistleblower has the dirt on a lot of uh, people inside of Nissan, and therefore they decided to throw the boss under the bus. And the theory that, well, maybe this whistleblower is the man you just heard. Well, the, the, other, yeah, the other theory is that, is that Goen might have been pushing for a merger of the yeah. two companies that went way beyond what the Japanese were willing to accept. They've got a very complicated cross-shareholding, which greatly benefits Renault at the expense of Nissan. So the Japanese have always bristled at it. And interestingly, it was Macron, it was president of France now, as economy minister in 2015, who pushed through that shareholding pact and that the Japanese have never liked. So... The thought that 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 Gohan might have been trying to behind the scenes sort of create a merger of the group that would cement that sort of advantage that Renault has over Nissan, that's that's one of the theories as to why right, they we're moved gonna, to we're push We're going to pick up on that theory when we come back. Stay with us. You're watching the world this week. Welcome back, or welcome if you're just joining us. It's The World This Week, The World This Week, in partnership with The Daily Beast. Daily Beast foreign editor Christopher Dickey is with us. Welcome back as well to Mark Bassett's Paris Bureau Chief for El País, the Spanish daily newspaper. Cristino Kello, sister station Radio France International. And Gregory Viscusi of Bloomberg News, who is telling us about the demise uh, of uh, the uh, a man who was at the helm of a company that, uh, of an alliance, rather, that uh, sells uh, 10 and a half million uh, vehicles a year, number one in the world. Now, never do we peddle in conspiracy theories on the world this week, but we're always happy to point out fortuitous coincidences. The Financial Times reporting Wednesday that Nissan's board was resisting attempts by Ghosn and Renault to make uh, the alliance with Nissan a permanent uh, merger. Christopher Dickey. Well, I mean, I think that could be a conspiracy. It certainly seems plausible. One of the things that our correspondent in Tokyo pointed out is that this whole question of uh, masking your salary by charging things off to the company, in, sometimes in enormous amounts, it goes on quite frequently in Japan. Uh, but people might be hauled on the carpet technically for it, but they're not arrested. They're not thrown in jail. They're not eating three bowls of rice a day because of it. This is clearly an effort not only to, um, to punish Gon, but to humiliate him. Now, why would they do that? Is that just a Japanese cultural thing? Or is it, uh, in fact, a shot across the bow of anybody who's trying to arrange something like a merger rather than just an alliance? Mark Bassett? You know, it reminds me, and excuse me if the, co the comparison is too stretched, of something that happened a few years ago with uh, Dominic Strauss-Kahn who was a very prominent politician, a figure in France, uh, a symbol of certain things in France, as Carlos Ghosn is. He was also arrested in a foreign country, and he was, there were also all kinds of uh, theories about why, why then, etc. So this episode has reminded me in the... In the uh, I don't know. I, I covered that. I don't think Carlos Ghosn had exactly the same problems. That <laughs> no, of course. That, that's why I said that the comparison is no, no, that it's not. two completely different. It's, it's not sex here. It's money. Money is the issue. <laughs> I think his salary was, 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 was huge. I mean, last year he earned something like, what, 
12 15, million. 12 million uh, euros, four times the amount of uh, Tokyo's chairman. And I think in Japan, that really sort of raised eyebrows and the kind of lifestyle he was leading was was very brazen, was very brash. There was a, yeah, there was a big wedding in yeah, Versailles. Yeah, Versailles, yeah. the Marie Antoinette themed party. I mean, I would have loved to have been there, you know. <laughs> Just having a big I wasn't full gown. I wasn't invited. Okay. And, 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 and back in yeah. 2016, uh, there was a shareholders' revolt at Renault yeah, uh, because he earned his, too much money. His he, seven million euro salary. Exactly. So he he completely sort of uh, falsified well, he falsified his salary, and and he and and his compensation package just just didn't go down well with the Japanese uh, culture. So he, I think he, he was too he was too. And also, you know, you know, he 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 was an extraordinary he was an extraordinary CEO in that he did save two companies. I mean, you know, when they, yeah. when when Renault took over Nissan, they were in terrible shape. Yeah. It was in 1999. You know, yeah, yeah, well, 20 years ago, let's say. Um, and you know, he certainly has done a great job at Renault, but he's probably the, the job has been done. You know, I think in yeah. both I think in both countries they've kind of tired of him. You know, and because the of the things that you mentioned, yeah. that I think they're sort of both sides. I mean, the Japanese certainly are willing to move beyond them, but I think the French it's, are it's too. It's absolutely fascinating to see who who this who this man is. Uh, he. Um, uh, Lebanese born, French educated, yeah. Lebanese, excuse me, heritage. Le Le Brazilian, Brazilian born, born yeah. Uh, French, uh, educated. Fr French, French educated. French educated. His nickname 7 Eleven because he'd work every day from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. Yeah. Wow. And, and uh, it's more like 9 week, 11 now. <laughs> one week, one week in, uh, in, in Japan every month, one week in France. Well, he's got six houses, yeah. Rio, New York, um, Beirut, Paris. Amsterdam, where the alliance is so sort what, of registered, yeah. and Tokyo. What was the street rep of Carlos Ghosn before this all blew up? Well, he was like the savior of, uh, of Yeah, Nissan, they're, they're like comic books about him in Japan. He was yeah. a huge hero yeah. when he saved Nissan. But as I say, you know, that, I think people have forgotten that these companies yeah. were in trouble. They're not in trouble now. And so I just think that he's, yeah. I, I, I think at this point, having, having, having done the job. Yeah. And I think people forget, you know, when once it's one things things have been done, they forget. They have short yeah. memories. You know, when things are not going well, they remind you. They 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 they're very quick. And he's, cla to he's clashed with a lot of people. Yeah. All right, on the hashtag world this week, a lot of reactions. This one, it seems like an excuse to get back at Nissan and uh, to get back Nissan and Mitsubishi into Japanese hands. Right after Gon executed the turnaround. Now at the Yokohama Nissan plant, opinion divided. Mm over the legacy of Carlos Ghosn. Mr. Ghosn has worked hard to make Nissan into a great company. It's a pity what's happened. I think Ghosn was a dictator. He was paid way too much. And not paying taxes is not good. It gets back to what you were saying about your Tokyo correspondent, Chris Dickey, mm. because you know, the corporate culture in multinational uh, firms, in this case, it's not one firm, it's an alliance between two companies, is always something difficult to manage. Well, yeah, I, even when this first was announced 20 years ago, I was like, how are they gonna do that? How are they gonna match the corporate, <laughs> uh, the corporate culture of a French company like Renault with the Japanese culture of Nissan and more to the point, how is a Lebanese heritage Brazilian born guy <laughs> gonna do it? And he, did, and he worked miracles, come on. I mean, he saved yeah. both companies, and it worked very well for a long time. But if we're going to make analogies, sometimes stretching a bit, I think it's a little bit like Winston Churchill. He got Britain through the war, and then yeah. they voted him they out. They voted him out right away, yeah, because they, yeah. they were tired of him. And I think it sounds like a very bad shake. It's, 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 it's like a Shakespearean tragedy, you know, the hero. Oh, yeah. falls but the rather, from the his rather more mundane examples yeah. of business people, Jack Welsh and GE, I mean, the rather yeah. examples of people who, after a certain point, you know, they, the company just wants to move on. But people right. here in this country are suddenly remembering that there were a spate of suicides at Renault, that uh, the conditions, he was known as low cost killer. And yeah. people now uh, re re remembering us, uh, re remembering that. Emmanuel Macron uh, has, uh, when he came to office, blown up the mainstream political parties. He's since stared down the trade unions, but has France's president met his match this time with a leaderless protest movement against rising fuel prices. The gilets jaunes, yellow vests, reminding us that uh, carbon taxes on diesel and unleaded come on the heels of a decade where spending power has failed to grow for the middle classes in this country. The only reason they're increasing taxes is to tax people as much as they can. If they'd brought in free bus passes or didn't close the smaller train stations, Maybe we wouldn't have reacted this way. 
My parents and everyone around me are struggling. I'm taking my driving test. If prices keep going up, I won't be able to cope. Now, this uh, this uh, yellow vest movement, uh, Mark Bassett, uh, it's uh, a chance to remind people that uh, uh, France, one of the world's biggest economies, the median income is uh, uh, last year is 1,710 euros uh, a month net. That means if you earn more than 20,520 euros a year, you're in the top 50 percent of, of money earners. It's not much money, especially in the Paris area. And the what they call here the pouvoir d'achat, the uh, spending power. Spending power is a big uh, concept in uh, French politics. It always comes back, you know, and it's the it's the, the way to measure the the, the unhappiness of the of the people. And, the, and this issue I, clearly is an issue of the so-called people. I don't like this word, but uh, against the elites, you know, it's the issue that we've seen in so many countries in America, in the UK, uh, in Italy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It comes now to France. I mean, I think what's interesting is that this whole debate uh, sort of pits uh, a divide between, you know, uh, the social, la justice social, um, the need for, for, to ensure that people you know, have a decent purchasing power, they have their social needs are met, and yet also creates this you know, other sort of clash that, you know, we also need to save the planet. But, you know, how do you go about saving the planet and, and ensuring that people aren't left behind? You know, this is an issue we've been covering on our website at RFI English looking at how the government has been trying to respond to people's concerns, you know, to better pass this, uh, this pill, this bitter pill, if you like, of, uh, of accepting the need to uh, tran transition to a, renew a renewable energy society. And so far, it's, it's failing. We're, we're not a... Uh, and, and it pits, it pits, this, it pits uh, Macron's voters who tend to be urban and don't rely on cars and are interested yeah. in ecology with the most of the country that still, that still relies on their cars. I mean, we think of French being, France being a country of public transport. I checked. The percentage of people who commute to work alone in their car every day is basically the same in France as it is in the U.S. Wow. It's, it's, not, that, it's not that different. Now, yeah. th the biggest blow to date for Macron has been the shock resignation of his most popular cabinet member. Former Environment Minister Nicolas Hulot, a former TV host, reemerged Thursday night for the first time since he quit and on national television was asked about the carbon tax uh, that was uh, instituted in this country during a political chat show. I defended it, alongside many others, and I take it upon myself, but only if measures are taken to help people to adapt to it. That's what's missing today. They've been missing all along. I repeat it, these measures were missing all along. You're saying that now, but did you say it back then? I said it at the time. Everyone knows that. So Nicolas Hulot, uh, Christopher Dickey said, I was in favor of the carbon tax, I defended it, but I also wanted there to be measures so that the little guy uh, doesn't feel the pinch. Well, that's in fact what, what one of the little guys on the street was saying. If we were getting free bus pa passes or it were easier to get uh, uh, rail transport and cheaper to get rail transport, then maybe we could buy this. I think that Greg touched on something very important here that I think many, many people who look at France don't understand, and that is that France is not Paris. France is a much bigger country, and even a lot of people who work in Paris have to drive to work, even though there's a pretty good network of rail out into the outer, into the sort of medium outer suburbs. People still drive long distances to get into Paris and to get to their jobs, and these kinds of taxes affect them immediately. I would add to that that Paris itself, for the people who are coming in, has become more and more difficult to deal with if you're driving a car. Um, Anne Hidalgo, the mayor, has made it extremely difficult and unpleasant to have a car in Paris. She's closed all kinds of highways. There's all kinds of things going on that are huge irritants to people who have to depend on cars. And I think around. one thing to keep in mind outside of Paris is that French, French, small French towns are dying. I mean, mm -hmm. all the local services are closing. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they're closing post offices, they're closing hospitals. Little shops are closing. Everything's moving out to its shopping yeah. center. So you need well, your car. Part of you that. need your car more than ever. Like you exactly. can't live in a small town exactly. and live alone. But it's part. It's yeah. like what happened in America. America, of course, is built around the car. I mean, that's the way America is constructed. France was not, but more and more it is. It is. There are more and more big malls, yeah. hypermarkets, all these kinds and of things. And fewer and fewer shops in and, the town. And it's killing. Yeah. It's killing the home, the uh, main street. And then public services. It's just. It's a huge issue. I mean, you talk. You go to. You go into parts of France. There used to be a hospital 10 minutes away. Now the closest hospital drive. is 30, 40 minutes away. Mark Bassett, you were in the northern port city of Calais this week. Yes. 
what do they think there of the yellow vests? Well, I, I spent some time uh, on Wednesday night with people, with uh, ye- yellow vest people that were trying, blocking, and not blocking a, a road. You know, they were blocking it sometimes and they went away. But well, what, what did they learn? They, I don't know what they want, really. Mm. Some of them were against the tax uh, for, for gasoil, for di- diesel. Others said, we don't want more taxes. And others just directly said, we want Macron out. Uh, we want him to resign, which is completely unrealistic, mm. you know. And they don't want to have leaders. They don't want to have politicians. Well, I, I, I talked with people from, from far left who had uh, par- taken part in demonstrations uh, from the far left in the, in the last uh, years or months, but people who had ideas were quite near from the far right. So, And that's what scares the president. Well, but I fact, think... There is no leader. Well, well, is that scary or not? I mean, this reminds me so much of, uh, in 2011, the Occupy Wall Street movement where you had no leaders, people were getting together, they were making a big deal, there was Occupy this, Occupy that, all over America, very much like this. And it, it died, it melted. Why? Because there was no leadership, there was no organization. What happens inevitably there is there is enormous amount of infighting, there's no agenda, people decide that they want radically different things and that occupying or putting on yellow vests and stopping traffic, that's going to accomplish it, but it doesn't. And when it doesn't, the whole thing just collapses. And that's what I would predict for this. And I think also yeah. Nikon, like previous governments before him, has been almost very contradictory in his approach to, you know, uh, enforcing so a green revolution. Says he's going to big announcements next yeah, Tuesday. Yeah, he's announcing big announcements next Tuesday. But for years, France has been encouraging people to buy diesel. For yeah. like, Diesel was, you know, the, uh, the safe, uh, safe fossil fuel mm, to buy. And, and now there's, you know, the major U-turn, sorry, now we have to sort of change and, and not not use diesel anymore. So people are kind of like, you know, what's going on? You, know, you <laughs> Make up your it? mind, you know, what, yeah. do, you, what yeah. do you want? I'm not so sure, Chris, we'll, we'll see what happens. I'm just not sure this thing's going to go away. There's, I, think, I think something's going on here. It's, it's right. mm. From yellow vests to Le Black Friday, <laughs> another <laughs> illustration of like U.S. soft power. <clears throat> the rest of the world may not adopt Thanksgiving, but thanks in no small part to the World Wide Web and online promotions, Black Friday sales have become a part of the lexicon the world over, including here in France. Are you surprised? Including here in France, a friend of mine posted a photo on Facebook from a newspaper in Zambia talking about Black Friday Mm -hmm. specials. So, oh, you mentioned you mentioned that it is a worldwide phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dateline South Africa, the Canal Walk Shopping Center, that's in Century City, Cape Town where this time they gave out tickets to avoid the stampedes <laughs> of last year. Oh, so goodness. it was more orderly and more That's celebratory. I, I cut off Mark. Um, your, your thoughts, Christina Okello, on the wanton consumerism I mean, going I think global. Just on the transition from the Yellow Vest protest to Black Friday, I think it's almost ironic that you know, people are complaining about spending a, a few more extra centimes because they didn't want to, like, Pay uh, more more money for for, for petrol for, for for gas, but yet uh, but yet you know uh, the, we've we've been looking at Green Friday also on our website, so we've done the, 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 clash, the contrast between again. Black Friday, Green Friday, and pe- some people are saying, well, let's consume less, but yet they don't want to pay more for for gas. So it, it, there's a bit of also uh, yeah. Let's ex- yeah. let's explain that uh, <laughs> bl- uh, Black Friday may be relatively new to France, but already yes. we have a backlash here. Yes, a whole host of Green Friday initiatives, including. Sales on energy-saving appliances, calls to buy local and avoid big carbon footprints. One online petition on the French edition of the Huffington Post by environmentalists denounces the feeding of, quote, Pavlovian consumer reflexes, Mark Bassett. <laughs> well, uh, what does that there, mean? Is a, yeah, there, is a, there is a long tradition in France of, uh, you know, not n- against consumerism, but also anti-American, of course. And Black Friday we, is uh, is an American thing that we, we buy the a lot French, of blue jeans and we eat a lot of McDonald's hamburgers. More than anyone, I think. Yes. <laughs> and it's not even Vendredi Noir. No. It's, no. it's Black Friday. Yeah. But I would like the French to, or the Europeans or the rest of the world to, to import Thanksgiving. I, I, I love Thanksgiving. You know? For me, it's the, it's the counterpart of, yeah. of Black Friday and it's a, it's a, it's no, a wonderful... So you can have Black Friday, but you have to have Thanksgiving, right? Yeah. yeah. I want to have... Uh, if we have to have Black Friday, please let us have uh, Thanksgiving. Yeah. <laughs> If anything, for the turkey, you know, like everyone likes a, a good but, turkey. Chris Rudicki, what, what are your thoughts? You're as an American in Paris. You, you, it's, is it like the do Look, you feel I like can it's re- the United States coming to France? Well, it is, but it's not the worst thing that ever happened to France to have sales. I mean, <laughs> you know, 
<laughs> 30, 30 years ago in France, you would, they would, sales were very rare. They were weirdly regulated, they and they would only be years. seconds. It's like you'd go in and, oh, that's on sale. Oh, it's broken. Well, that's why it's on sale. <laughs> you know, and to see this kind of marketing that's developed over the last 30 years in France, it's not the worst thing that ever happened. I, I, I sense you're looking a little bit down on this concept of the Green Friday. I certainly am. I mean, I Why? think, well, look, I mean, it's a nice idea, but, <laughs> but as, I, as I tweeted, uh, if Anne Hidalgo wants to say, let's make this Green Friday, mm -hmm. I'm all in favor of a greener Paris, but I'd like to see a cleaner Paris, mm -hmm. okay? <laughs> it's a very poorly run city now, but we can talk about that another time. Gregory Viscusi? I agree. I mean, I, I, look, I, I'm someone who rides a bicycle everywhere around town, so I'm definitely like, you know, poster boy for green. Thing. But on the other hand, you know, for people who don't want to ride a bike, the, the metro system is, is deteriorating. In Paris. Mm. You know, I mean, it is. I mean, when I do take the metro, more, much, it's much, much more common in the past to have, you know, trains that stop. That, but the you know, Green Friday all, concept. The trains don't arrive, and so... It's they they've got to get that working but before. You, I'm t I'm totally happy to shut Paris off to cars, but there's got to be an alternative. Mm. And the Green Friday concept. <sighs> Look, I mean, everything works with gimmicks these days. What yeah. do you want to do? <laughs> I mean, I've, I was looking at the images beforehand. It just reminds me of Boxing Day in London. I'm mm. from from the UK, and it's uh, and it's always like a mad rush. And you're trying to find like the the, the latest uh, the latest sort of you know, outfit um, uh, on on sale. And it's um, it's it's sort of strange to me to see that those kind of images in France. Uh, I've always, you know, I kind of like left the UK because of that reason because consumerism was everywhere. And I always found the French a bit more a bit more quaint, a bit more low key. And it's uh, go back to your question. No, it's I think almost you just, like, uh, you just have to walk down any shopping street in France and you yeah. see this is a country that does like to consume yeah. as much as and I find that a I shame because I mean I, I, I need to go back to London or maybe go find another country because it's consumerism is well look consu uh, consumerism everywhere. is what pushes the economy let's not forget what what is Black Friday really about in fact it's not about Thanksgiving it's about Christmas yeah, yeah. it's, it's about Christmas going and, and giving a big boost to sales before Christmas before you get right up against it and I think that's a perfect and that is one thing. nice thing about Thanksgiving is that it does at least pro does at least mean that Christmas shopping doesn't begin until after Thanksgiving. In France, in some places, they start putting up Christmas decorations in late September now. Oh. You know, but late September, early October. Well, at least beautiful. Thanksgiving sort of, sort of, sort of, you know, puts a barrier. Florists have already got Christmas trees all over the oh. place now. Well, which also thirty years ago you couldn't find. Or you might choose the option of doing your shopping on December twenty third. Gregory Viscusi, I want to thank you. I think we know Mark who does Bassett, that. Huh? Uh, Christopher Dickey as well. Christina Okello, stay with us. Media Watch is next.